Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at our terrace with Frank Schirmeiser. I'm going to talk today about the challenges of integrating RISC-V designs. Frank, no matter where you go these days, RISC-V is, is a presence. We're hearing RISC-V designs almost everywhere. But how do you integrate those? Because each one is very unique. Well, the scenario as it typically goes, it's always product management's fault. So they read up that uh, RISC-V gives you the freedom to innovate and uh, to do your bespoke custom designs, optimize it for the workloads your company wants to do. And then the product management guy comes in and says, well, I, I have it all done for you. I licensed the RISC-V core. I licensed my all the other peripherals you need. So just go ahead and integrate it. And it's typically not easy to do that. So that's what we're talking about here today. Let's look into more detail. Frank, what are we looking at? Well, the evil product manager came in and said, I'm building this machine learning accelerator with some vision components uh, for automotive. And um, the program manager basically says, it's all figured out, right? So you have um, a couple of uh, RISC-V cores here in your compute environment, some caching going on. So I'm drawing two clusters here for this, right? So then you have some domain specific, um, like some accelerators going on here accelerating functionality that's off, often kind of a secret source of things and you have some um, like let's say some image uh, uh, processing going on with uh, ISPs you have a machine learning subsystem often you find these to be these uh, rather regular structures so I'm not drawing them out here you have a safety island if it's automotive then down here you have the memory, so the green part is um, uh, the chip, so you have outside DRAM um, going in here. And um, uh, that's connected to your memory controller here on chip. You have high-speed wired interfaces, uh, wireless stuff, so you have all these blocks um, going on. You have wireless um, uh, transmission for Wi-Fi, you have a security bit, especially in automotive, uh, very important. You have all these um, subsystems, if you will, I.O., HDMI, it's um, somebody wants to play and display everything. So that's all the blocks. So now how do you connect them up inside and then even across the chip, this chiplets? The challenge here is that you, these do not connect in a very standard way, right? Because each piece is almost like what you're doing with chiplets, where each one is going to be unique. Each one is going to have its, its own characteristics. Right, so the two big items to um, consider first is like who is actually sharing memories, right? So there may this guy here may um, share with the compute sus subsystem this memory here, right? So you ha have cache coherency to be considered with these caches here coming from the compute subsystem. You have a bunch of other pieces that are more important to look at from a perspective of latency, throughput, predictability. So this is what we call um, the non-coherent bit. So this would be um, non-coherent. And this would be, the other part here would be coherent, uh, interconnect. So now that's a high level picture. Who actually needs to talk at which level? Who needs to talk um, coherent or non-coherent to each other. And then one thing you pointed to with your questions already is these guys, when you license them, they may have all different interfaces. So here you may have something like a chai.e interface or chai.b. Um, here you may have a bunch of AXI. So typically you actually find in these subsystems your own uh, sub-networks non-coherently. So those are um, the non-coherent networks in here. And here you speak things like AXI, you speak things like OCP. There may, there's also then another coherent protocol here. There's ACE going on that should have been blue. And um, so you have this protocol salad of all these different uh, protocols you need to be aware of. OCP is another one of them, which is uh, a little bit older. They're new emerging. They are like Variants which then connect to things like uh, CXL, for example, for the outside connection and PCIe. So it's an it's a protocol salad to deal with. So one of the challenges is 
how do you bring them all together for the coherent and non-coherent bits of the chip? And so how do you do that? Because that is one of the big challenges. We as a NOC company, a network on chip company, we have all these um, protocols um, learned, if you will. We have specific um, interfaces for our NOC, which takes the different interfaces and unifies the protocol cell and allows you to combine everything, both in a coherent and in a non-coherent fashion, and then have an internal protocol that carries all that along and translates it for it. So you as a designer who just figured out, oh, I have this really cool new freedom to innovate risk five modification of my core, you don't need to worry about the protocols of all the other components you integrate with. So what happens when you get into, say, a difference between a planar chip versus 2.5D versus 3D or some fan out, fan in? You've got all these different possibilities that are out there these days, and each one is a little bit unique. So that's a um, challenge kind of stacked on top of it, pun intended, um, where you have the potential um, product management requirement that all of this has to go across chiplets. So you have a chiplet interface here, so you may go over, go over UCIE, between them, so now, yeah, now you need to um, figure out how your um, memories are, for example, shared. There are different configurations you need to deal with. Over here, this um, partner for the chiplet scenario may have to access your memory, so now all the snooping that goes on in coherency needs to be carried across the, the chiplet boundaries and so forth. That becomes very complicated. That's kind of the fourth step, though, because Unification is the first bit, um, trying to make sense of all the blocks you have licensed and connecting them. Connecting things up within the systems is the second item, right? So if you have all these RISC-V cores, or even here the accelerators, often these are DSPs, and then the machine learning elements, you need to um, connect them for machine learning. You not often need coherency. These guys uh, basically get their data presented to them. Here it's more important about things like broad width in this mesh where we can essentially here connect uh, in a mesh form in a non-coherent way with, um, uh, uh, with our products the different um, um, processing elements up. <clears throat> so these connections need to be done first before you even think about the connections to the outside, which is really an architecture choice because this might just flip on the other side and you need to figure out which of these protocols do you then actually package and transmit over the chiplet interface using UCIE, perhaps with a CXS streaming interface. So that needs to be done at a top-down architecture level. And to some extent, what you're doing here is really enabling the democratization of the design here too, right? Because most companies that are going to be developing this do not have this expertise internally. That's right. So if you look into the how this all evolved over time, uh, when I um, started in my first jobs back in Germany still, we just had invited, invented the VSI Alliance, the Virtual Socket Interface Alliance, that later became, became Spirit and um, 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 et cetera and so forth with IP exact. And um, that was early on a um, way to connect these things up. And then ARM, got to give some credit, had a lot of to do with things. They invented Amber in the mid-90s. That was about two, 300 pages of spec. Today, if you want to understand all these, those are thousands of pages of spec. So you really don't want your um, teams, as they are figuring out the differentiation and want to deal with the software and the right final modification of the tuning of the RISC-V course, you don't want them to be distracted with having to learn these protocols and, and how they all connect, what potential um, interface considerations you have to make. We have done all that and that's what we call here the de-risking of the projects because you really can focus on your differentiation in what you're building at the systemic architecture level and at the differentiation level with your accelerator, the software on it, or with your compute subsystem on it. So de-risking of those projects is very important. One of the challenges as you move forward into things like RISC-V though is, and, and heterogeneous compute in general, is that you're mixing a lot of things in terms of partitioning and prioritization. How does that work with a, a, a NOC? Well, you have to make some system architecture decisions and uh, I think 
the kind of hidden secret what's often forgotten in today's discussions. There are really three level of chiplet um, connections, right? So they're actually out there for quite some time. If you look at the big players like the AMDs, the NVIDIAs, the Intel, they control all of, the, all of that, right? So they say, we just need our phi here, just of course in air quotes, we just need our phi here um, to, for the eye diagrams to work on the other side of my design as I connect things and they can decide the protocol that goes in here. These things are called uh, flits for the streaming. Those are the, the serialized protocols. So then you have a protocol stack where you basically say, okay, here I have, for example, a CHI, the current hub interface from ARM going in. I may have CXS here, and then I have UCIE, or to be fair, a bunch of wires uh, to go over here. So as I consider all this, I now need to understand, will these actually both have to access this memory? Then cache coherency needs to play, and then all the effects like snooping and so forth need to work. Those are all built in the uh, chai protocol that you basically figure out who has the last um, valid item in the caches and then a whole lot of coordination goes on. It's a huge difference whether you have a cache hit or cache miss, right, in terms of performance. Um, if these don't have to, uh, don't have to share this um, all the time, and uh, if they don't have to be fully symmetric, meaning this guy also has this DRAM and we need to look at both sides, you have subsets of coherency like IO coherency. So it needs to be architected right at the system level. For us as a NOC, it becomes kind of super NOCs, right? Because you now need to decide this NOC here, I have to have a flipped version here to talk over this and you need to take into account the uh, latencies, uh, the bandwidth, and so forth uh, from a systemic architecture level. So you've got all these things connected. Now what do you really have to think about from a RISC-V perspective as you're designing these chips? So beyond the NOC, because beyond the interconnect and the protocol you choose wisely, right? A C CHI, ACE, AXI for the non-coherence parts here, um, you need to really understand the ecosystem of the RISC-V core too, right? So connecting it sounds easy at first sight, but there are other things to be considered. So for example, debug, right? So there is a, when you look at the RISC-V standardization, they look very much about into things like trace to understand the data flow throughout the chip. And that's something which in other ecosystems is kind of provided together with the core in the RISC-V ecosystem, as it is a standard and a, um, an open ecosystem, these needs to be, need to be considered. Same things around the memory interface, the, the um, IOMMUs, the how you deal with the memory interface, how do you do simple things, in, in air quotes, like interrupts, like right? So you have these interrupt controllers that need to work and that you have your RISC-V processors to react to them completely, right? So, um, uh, or, or co consistently across different cores. This might be one vendor, there might be another vendor here, right? So there are a lot of ecosystem infrastructure items beyond the pure protocol to be considered. So it becomes um, um, <laughs> very interesting, uh, very fast to integrate all that together. and. Again, from an ecosystem perspective, we talked earlier about the different sets of uh, chiplet scenarios. If I own all this, if I'm the master of all things going on, I just decide, I use this, I use that. The whole promise of the chiplet ecosystem, to go back to that, is that um, you actually take your chiplet and you get it into multiple designs, kind of like PCI Express works today, if you will. Well, plug fists are not that trivial to do. You have to integrate it, test it. And in that context, you need to agree on a lot of things for these data to actually be in a po correct protocol, packaged, transmitted, and so forth. So for a full open ecosystem, a lot of additional items need to be considered so that you can have your chiplet and then get it into many designs for differentiation.
And a way to think about this is that you're no longer just looking at a stack die. You're looking at stacks of stacks, right? And right. you're trying to integrate each one. Each one of those stacks may be very different. That may, that's absolutely right. And you have then on top of it different protocol stacks, right? So the whole stack all the way to the software and how you program this and so forth um, becomes very interesting to deal with because this compute system may have to access in a fully symmetric way another DRAM over here. So that becomes very fast, a complicated item. That's why we see different topologies. And that's very important in our NOX here. We support different topologies. We go from mesh and flex NOC here to uh, various um, asymmetric, irregular topologies where you can basically decide, I have a very fast line going in here to the fast wireless or the fast wired, but I have a slower line going on to some peripherals or, or other aspects of the design. So that is all becoming a very <laughs> important aspect as you uh, plan that across chipnets. And even beyond that, as you go into this, you're looking at it from the standpoint of, from an architecture standpoint, the thermal issues, you're looking at all the short, short uh, channel effects, you've got a whole bunch of physical effects that, that you didn't deal with before, all that has to be built in here, right? Yeah, and uh, think about it, right? So if this is, this is just my functional diagram, which the product manager has put onto the whiteboard, literally. So now that becomes, at the end, the layout, right? So I have my different place components. Now the poor knock, to claim a little bit of um, misery here, has to basically fit into the bits between the floor plan blocks for of those items here, right? So now it becomes a question, how long are my wire delays? Um, how many pipeline stages do I have to insert? Those are things which we consider early on in, um, in the NOC development process. And you can imagine, we are not quite there yet, but uh, you can imagine things we um, predict early, if you will, estimate early by saying, okay, if, if the machine learning subsystem and the computing subsystem and they all access the memory, if they are too far away from each other, what does that mean for the metal I create as I connect everything up? And you can imagine even here having software running on stimulating essentially the wires mean at the end the copper metal um, on chip uh, how do I stimulate this? And you could actually look into heat maps early on, right? Because we know, for instance, where in this coherent or non-coherent bit, let's take non-coherent, where my different switches, my buffers, the different elements of the NOC are positioned. I can actually say, tell the layout tool, and we do this today, I can tell them, well, I have switches here and here, thinking of this more as a layout now. We give this information down into the digital implementation flow. And with that, you can then, as you pointed to thermal, you can eventually early on decide, okay, let me look at this, what type of data, how much switching is going on, what thermal effects can that have, and then be smart and move it away from some of the hotspot areas early on. Frank Schermeister, thanks for a great explanation of a very complex subject. Thanks for having me.